And I remember talking to my hiring manager at Bank of America in New York, and he was like, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. Like, you you don't even have a contract. Who knows if you're going to get a contract? And I trusted him, but I, tr- I trust my gut more than anything. Um, so I chose the professional soccer route. And uh, when I went to Seattle, and I started training with the team, I was like, holy crap, I'm training probably with the best players in the world. Well, Paige Nielsen, welcome to two wash-ups, one pro. Paige is a former Tar Heel. She's a Cornhusker at heart, one of the strongest both mentally and physically people that I know. We are so excited to have you on the podcast. You have literally been around the world. And I am so excited to have you on and, and you know, for you to share your story because it's an awesome one. Cool. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So we've been kind of just leading off with this question with everyone that we've been, um, we've been going with is, can you talk about that one, that one moment that you really fell in love with the game and kind of how it, you, you just felt that that true passion with soccer I know you played basketball a lot growing up so I'm curious to see yeah I'm curious to see when you you thought that you know soccer was your true passion and the one that you wanted to to go off with um that's a interesting question uh in eighth grade I got offered to Nebraska for both basketball and soccer and I, I was about ready to take it I loved both the sports and um However, when I was five, I drew a picture of a little girl um, with a North Carolina jersey saying, I want to go to North Carolina and play soccer one day. And my mom, like, always reminded me of that. Like, that was always in the back of my head. And, like, growing up in club, I I was always, like, one of the best in Nebraska, not to be, like, confident or cocky, but but I always, like, enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed being good and beating other people but but all of high school was really hard um I was getting pulled with social requests um and I really was getting kind of tired of all of my sport commitments and I was like okay did I make the right decision going to North Carolina um when I got offered as just to walk on and um So I don't, I think I was losing my love for the game because people around me started losing it. They were talking about the sororities they were joining and, and all the fun stuff that come with that. Um, It wasn't until I got to North Carolina my freshman year when I saw how passionate people were about the game and how um, people just cared so much for each other. I, I would like to give credit to North Carolina pickup games. Um, not even practice or games itself Um, but something about being in Chapel Hill with all the trees playing with men and women at like four or five after after classes with no pressure and um, basically elevating your game to an incredible level just by playing just by having fun and um I couldn't wait for those times after classes it was just like a release from everything from everything so I would say freshman year in North Carolina actually okay I'm gonna go into like a short story um my first my first away game was against UVA yeah um Lochner Stadium <laughs> the worst stadium I think it was the best biggest- come on it- it was the biggest field. I was a freshman. I wasn't fit. Like, I didn't know what fit meant in, until college. Um, I went in five minutes, and then I got pulled right out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> North Carolina has about seven lines. I'm, like, dying, and it's the 80th minute. He's bringing in the fourth line. I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, God, how many girls are on this team? Yeah. Well, I get pulled right out, and then after the game, my mom was there. She hugged Anson, like, shoot, did we make the wrong decision? Um, because I, I did awful. I was so nervous. Like, my nerves got the worst of me. Um, and Anson was just like, no, like, your daughter's going to be okay. And at that point on. I just got chills. <laughs> yeah. And at that point on, um, it, 
like I became obsessive about like what I was going to do to improve and and the program at Carolina is amazing you can use it to become an incredible player no matter where you start and um, I started falling in love with it after I after I was getting better <laughs> yeah it's it's fun once to you could see it yeah yeah very cool that's what I like that story because I I had one of those two against <laughs> the freshman <laughs> <laughs> I feel like every UNC freshman has the, you know, I was getting my, you know, 10 minutes at the end of the half and oh, yeah. that 10 minutes jumped in. I went in against Duke and was taken right out. I mm-hmm. know it's just a quick, a quick learning um, experience. You either sink or you swim, yeah. um, which is pretty, pretty cool. Okay. So we're going to kind of just jump right into it. Cause I know um, this person from, I think I don't know the answer to it, um, is interwoven um, throughout your career and out your life. But can you just kind of touch on that one person who has the greatest impact on your career and your development and everything you are as a person? Yeah, that's my mom. Yeah. Um, well, okay, Anson's one, but my mom is definitely like my key mom. <laughs> we, all, we all love moms, right? Yeah. Um, they made you, they want Mm -hmm. you to be successful. They see um, basically your true potential as a person, but also with what you're doing in life. And um, she was a single mom of four, uh, battled cancer twice, um, put herself through college, started two grassroots organizations for nonprofits, helping single moms, um, like sick all the time. And she never complained. She had a smile on her face and she, she always reminded us that we can do anything we put our mind to. Her One of her like go-to quotes, and I still have it in my car, is um, everything in life that comes your way is an opportunity. Whether good or bad, it's an opportunity to learn and grow from. And it's how you approach the cir- circumstances that make a difference. So it's all about positivity and taking everything that comes your way and learning from it. And... Um, I've, I've done that ever since I was like 16 years old. You know, we all go through some learning phases. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was a good kid, but like behind the scenes, um, probably made some mistakes and, um, but it's definitely, it's definitely got me to where I am today. And, um, she wouldn't, she wouldn't take no for an answer or if it's too hard, she would be like, you know, you can, you got this, take one day at a time. And um, she knew that I was going to be an awesome soccer player, but um, the most important was the type of person I'd be. And she she fell in love with the program. She came to a summer camp when I was in ninth grade, and she goes, this program is going to make you an amazing person, no matter if you do soccer for the rest of your life or uh, do something else. Um, you're going to have an amazing time. And she, so she, yeah, she's my superhero, and she passed away my junior year, mm-hmm. and now it's about me giving my life, not to her, but um, representing what she kind of set the building blocks for me and my other siblings to do. So um, yeah, we all we all want a purpose, and that's my purpose, and, and I feel like, I feel like I'm on my way. Yeah. For sure. Speaking, speaking just from seeing you through that whole process, just to see the strength and the grace and how you were able to shoulder it, but yet feel it, but yet use it, if that makes sense, like is a testament just to what an amazing job she did raising you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like to see how you were able to handle the hardest moment in your entire life is I think just another testament to what an amazing, amazing woman that she was. And I'm so lucky that I was able to meet her for a, for a few few times and, and to be around her because she had that aura about her that you just knew that like, that's a strong woman right there. And like, she's had to go through some shit and she look at look at what she's done um so to see to see how you've handled it and used it and and carried her and lived on in honor of her like that and and everything that you do is just a huge testament to her as a mom and i know i just i don't think i've ever told you that 
but um i've always i've always <laughs> i've always yeah i've no i've always wanted to say that and yeah no i've always wanted to say that because um just the grace that you carry yourself with is is remarkable and and i'm like, that's why i'm so excited to kind of let people hear your story is because not a lot came easy to you and um your perseverance and everything is just is is remarkable and inspiring so i'll stop my soapbox and let <laughs> tina ask the next question <laughs> yeah. well i mean i obviously didn't have the honor of meeting your mom but i think what we've learned in these podcasts is women are just incredibly powerful and strong and kind of learning about your story from afar it's clear why you took the steps that you did and were able to persevere so on that note obviously looking back now we know you had a great career at unc but that wasn't you didn't come in necessarily as this star recruit that, you know, had all these things waiting for them, which frankly, no one comes into you and see that way typically, even if you are a star recruit. Um, can you kind of talk about obviously being so close with your mom, growing up in the Midwest, having, as you said, opportunities to probably get scholarship, playing the Midwest and kind of taking that leap of faith on yourself to say, okay, I'm going to walk on at UNC, which is a historic program. There's never any guarantees, even for the top players. Um, and kind of going through that journey and, you know, earning a name for yourself in that program. Yeah. Um, okay. So where do you want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> I guess the decision to, to, to take, become a walk on yeah. and, and do that process. Um, and then kind of how you were able to, you know, find yourself a role, um, in the program. Yeah, well, the decision was easy, <laughs> um, <laughs> which it doesn't seem easy to many people. Mm -hmm. um, I talked to so many people and they're like, oh, well, that college is so good and I get a full ride here and I'm going to get playing time. You know, that's that's a classic story. And um, my mom just always taught me to be that small fish in a big pond because that's mm -hmm. where you learn and grow the most. Um and to take chances and risk all the time. She was like, you know what, you only live once. And um, she actually like made the decision for me. It made it easy. Uh, she she was she always knew me better than I knew myself. So when she passed, I was like, wait, what do I do? <laughs> Who's gonna tell uh, me what I need to do? Yeah. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. Um, not until I got there did I actually realize what I was getting into. To be honest. You know, you're young, you're naive, you think you're invincible. Um, I was one of the best. I got I got nominated for Gatorade Player of the Year in Nebraska, and I had no idea what else was out there um, until I got to the program, and I was like, holy crap, I'm with Crystal Dunn, Kalia, like, these players <laughs> that are incredible, and, um, but yeah, so... I would say it was easy for me because I've never, I've never not taken an amazing opportunity to try and prove to everyone else, but also me of what I'm capable of. And um, I fell in love with Chapel Hill when I went during the summer. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, going through your college visits and stuff, it's getting younger and younger. You're 14, 15 um so who knows if like you're making the right decision but after reading the book blink by malcolm gladwell it's mm -hmm. like this gut feeling where it's like okay i know i'm supposed to be here i don't know if, i don't know if you guys had that yeah, yeah i was just sorry i just wanted to add this i think you bring up a really good point about um i think when you're younger because i know that I, I transferred i went to vanderbilt my first year which i mean That's it was better. a great decision but as a university, it was a great decision. But I think looking back at the 15 year old me making the decision, to your point, I had this full scholarship waiting for me. And I think sometimes it's easier to make what you think is the easier path than the harder path. And I know looking back and then going to Virginia, where you guys know, I mean, Steve's the same way. You're never, he'll never sit down with somebody and say, 100% you're playing. You may, he may say you have a good shot if you come in and play well. But I think that's something to highlight in your story. And I think everyone goes to that when you're it's crazy now you're like 13 years old making decisions young players I think it's important to make a gut decision but also not always take the easier path because you never yeah. know I think your heart and your will coaches are going to play the people that are going to give the most effort and show up and improve themselves and um sorry I'm ranting but I I just think that's a really important note in the story because you know, Joanna was like an anomaly at eighth grade 
committing yeah. suicide. Yeah. That's like a norm now. No, That's but literally the, a norm now. But, but the, the cool thing is, I mean, not cool when I was a freshman, but like I came in high recruit, but like you ain't nothing. <laughs> like yeah. no matter no matter top recruit, walk on, like you got to earn your stripes. And if you don't, like I remember my freshman year, there were 12 of us. And like, we had so many people that there were like starters, reserves, and then there was like deep reserves. And like, you just had to battle. And like, it, it's it's pretty insane. It's pretty well, insane. You guys ranked, sorry, I just need this to clarify for all those non UNC. <laughs> you guys ranked after each training? Is that, a, is that a fact? Or is that like BS in the world? Or something, yeah. 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 Okay. So like the drills, it wouldn't be after each session. Well, I guess it would like, so if we did like a 5v2, then like that session that specific drill was tallied and then put into a spreadsheet that then would rank each one and then it was all tallied up and the, and then they had like a board at finley practice and you saw your name in each drill that they did uh -huh. um, so it kind of it, it just gave you like leverage and no one could complain about uh playing time because okay you're like at the top at every drill yeah. so like why yeah it, yeah. it makes it awesome and really super competitive because you can't take a playoff otherwise you're going to be at the bottom every single time and let me tell you there is nothing worse oh, than sitting at like <laughs> in, the red. They, in it's the red color, it's color coded so it's green yellow red <laughs> it's brutal and like tom will go in and like put it in the yeah. thing and or, like if it, it's like everyone's around and then you're like shoot me, shoot especially me, fitness you're like I need to, I need to be in the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, a dog eat dog world, but like looking back on it, it prepared me even for life after soccer, it prepared me for everything. So it's just like, yeah, we were 18, 19, 20 going through that, but like, we would have to learn it someday. <laughs> yeah, every, everyone in the workplace, professional yeah. soccer, they watch your every move anyway, even though yeah. people like don't write it down and put it on the board yeah those things go yeah. a long way yeah so you go in you immediately win a national championship as a freshman yeah. in 2012 Check. as a forward as a forward mm -hmm. but throughout your career you bounced all through down the spine midfield center back mm -hmm. talk about how you handled that mentally because I think it's tough to just be kind of moved around where you feel like like I think it was your my sophomore year like you were killing it at four and he's like i think we're gonna play you in the back now yeah <laughs> like she's killing it up top and so talk about like how mentally you finally feel like you're at the spot that you're you're, gonna, you're supposed to be at and then like you start to play center back which is now what you play yeah okay well that's interesting i've always had this gut feeling again to blink that i was uh -huh. natural center back um, really I was a point guard in basketball, yeah, and I could just read the game so well. I always wanted to be safety in football. I was like, mm -hmm. okay, if NFL was there, I want to be a safety because I just liked reading everything. Um, but my mom and people were like, no, you're too good to be a dump, dumpy defender. Like, all they do is tackle and kick the ball. And um, <laughs> she was like, you're a midfielder. You're just like Crystal Dunn. And I was like, hold on. <laughs> hold on. You are biased because you're my mom. Um, and I was like always so technical and skillful and I always had, um, an eye for the goal. I just wasn't fit enough at the moment. And so I, I didn't actually mind going in the back and just kind of, um, chilling back there, especially at North Carolina when we had a pressing system and, um, and they get subbed no matter what, you know, the starters play for 30 minutes and they come in the reserves come in for 15 minutes and that's the half. I always watch the defenders. They got to play 90 minutes the entire time. <laughs> Move me back there. Play me yeah. 90. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. That was my thought process. I was like, I just yeah. want to play. I hate being on the bench. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know? Uh, the worst is like, did he ever give you like the, the whole like Yael Averbush came off that did that story of like, well, I'm not tired. And he's like, well, you should be. Like, yeah <laughs> was it yeah yeah i think yeah, it was yeah it was someone 
but I was like, okay, I'll never tell you I want to play more than my 30 minutes ever again. Right, right. He was like, that's why you did come off, because you're not tired. You should be running more. Yeah, it's like you have no answer, no question to ask him about it, because he always comes back with something that's like, oh, well, that makes sense. Yeah. Crazy, crazy stuff. But yeah, moral of the story is like, I've always been kind of a utility player. Um, mm -hmm. I think when you're not good, but you're not bad at everything, that's what happens. You're very average mm -hmm. at everything until you find a position that really fits your skill sets. And um, so I really took the time in college, those four years, to really find what I love and what I was most natural about. And I just enjoyed playing on the field, to be honest. And during trainings and stuff, everyone plays every position. So Yeah. So talk about – I know you obviously – um, your mom is one of the most, is the most special person in your life. Talk about the role Anson's played. Cause I think he's also played, played, we got to shout out Anson here. So yeah. go ahead. I'll give you the floor on Anson. Well, I just saw him on Sunday. We played North Carolina Courage mm -hmm. on Saturday and he, uh, he's a, he's a father figure to me. He, I feel bad for some players that don't get to know him and don't get as close because he really does care about each individual pretty much equally and wants the best for us. I couldn't agree uh, more. Yeah, he really does. And um, and he wants to get close to you and influence your lives, but people are like scared of him or something. And he's always he's always believed in me and saw potential in me, even though he says potential is crap and, unless you prove it, right? Um, but he, yeah, he goes, you're going to go far. I see you as a professional. Um, the only way you're going to be professional is playing a center back. So he knew, he knew it and I didn't and my mom didn't, but he's a very smart guy. And if it weren't for him, I probably would have cracked my senior year after my mom passed because he's yeah. been through some sickness, all of life's battles. And he's, he really brought the team together that, um was an amazing support and um yeah he's just an amazing guy and he yeah. doesn't he doesn't he does care that you're good at soccer or whatever but he just really cares about um everyone that's around him and all the positive vibes and how fun that we have being competitive and um yeah I also want to be successful because of him because he's fighting for all of us in the professional leagues in UNC he's constantly talking to the national team coach to all mm -hmm. the coaches mm -hmm. trying to advocate for his players so I couldn't agree more with I haven't ever thought about it but like I couldn't when you said that I feel bad for the people that really didn't get to know him that have gone through the program and I don't think it's a lot of people yeah but the amount of knowledge and the amount of care that that man has for people is just unreal yeah. like it's it gives me chills because like he's just truly an amazing human being that wants literally the best for you and it's it's yeah it's it's pretty that's you know obviously you go to UNC but like you go to play for Anson mm -hmm. and I think that's that's super cool that he's been able to um create that culture at such an unbelievable school. So yeah, I wanted to give you the floor on Anson because it's so hard to ask like a question about him yeah. because like he's so Anson. So I was just like, let me just give her, we'll just give her the floor and let her. I could it. talk about him for like two days. Oh, yeah. He yeah. answers every time I call. Oh, the I know. This man. I know. In life, but he answers every time I call. Like if, um, if one of us, like if one of us text him, like respond within five minutes. Yeah. He's phenomenal. And he has 400,000 emails and he's just like, no, I'm going to respond to my players. Yeah. Yeah. I love hearing that. Cause I, being at UVA, I would say the same thing about Steve. And I think that's a big reason why these coaches have so, I mean, Anson, obviously all the accolades and national titles, but I think like when you think about longevity, despite all those wins, I hear that consistently from players. And I just think it speaks so highly to the importance also of like your head coach and, mm -hmm. and, pairing with somebody that is not going to just invest in you as a player but as a person because like thinking of your story I mean you battled something your junior year that no one should have to battle that young and to have that support system is so important um well Joanna filled me in you're obviously a woman of many talents uh we oh <laughs> knew that you left UNC and you actually had a full-time role 
opportunity kind of in front of you where frankly you could have been like a I'm good I'm good with soccer I can make my you know livable income and and do that um you decided to per- we obviously know now you decided to pursue soccer and it's gone well and that's awesome can you kind of talk about um the life of a of a player not even just in the end of a cell but what you've had to go, go through from being somebody that's relying on this as your career, right? You're trying to compensate yourself and make a livable wage while pursuing a dream. Can you kind of talk about how you made ends meet, kind of your an intro into the league, going to Seattle and kind of turn, having to earn a spot? How was um, that for you? And can you kind of talk about what your life was like? Because I think a lot of people are have a misconception about, oh, I'm a professional athlete. Like it's all glitz and glam, but that's obviously not the case. We're working towards that, by the way. The, the Where, yeah. Um, because we do put in so much work. But uh, yeah, I passed a, maybe a six-figure job in New York, um, starting salary to play in Seattle, not guaranteed a contract. Um, so I would be playing for free mm-hmm. um, and living at a host family, which is like my second family. I chose to live with them. And I remember talking to my hiring manager at Bank of America in New York, and he was like, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. Like, you you don't even have a contract. Who knows if you're going to get a contract? And I trusted him, but I, tr- I trust my gut more than anything. Um, so I chose the professional soccer route. And uh, when I went to Seattle, and I started training with the team. I was like, holy crap, I'm training probably with the best players in the world. Jess Fishlock, Kim Little, those two players are, I think, the best players in the world or have been. Hope Solo, you know, and I was a young rookie who who I didn't even think I was going to get drafted. I was in Germany, like, trialing for a team, and they're like, "Are you, would you play in the U.S. Um, if, you, if you got drafted? And I was like, yes, of course. Not even thinking that contracts aren't guaranteed. <laughs> So I go there in March and I start training and don't hear anything about a contract and I have to pick up a couple of jobs to support myself and before my student loans come and get me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then that wasn't paying for my car bills and all my other bills. So I was doing three jobs. I was like dog walking. I was an athletic director for the Bellevue Club in Seattle and I was also like house sitting and babysitting. So um, that was a lot. I had no time to do anything. I woke up at 5 a.m. and didn't go to bed till like 11 or 12 doing all these things. And I would go into early and practice every day and do technical work trying to make the team. And then I met my my science, sports science guy, Nick Lehman. He's actually really powerful human in my story as well because he really believed in me he's like you have potential you're better than this player she's starting whatever I don't know he's like you know people are biased or whatever but he would come to the gym with me to help me get more fit every single day in the afternoon for an hour and a half and I'll do intense bike workouts like treadmill workouts on top of training and on top of doing extra work in the morning on top of my three jobs so I've, <laughs> So I wasn't sleeping. I wasn't, I was going all in in this. And I think it was like a, um, a mechanism for me to like trying to deal with my mom because she actually passed away in Seattle and I was living in the house where she lived in before she passed away. So there's a lot of things going on. I think I drank wine like every night for a little bit. (laughs) Um, just what? Hoping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And finally in April, not hearing anything. No, in May, not hearing anything for like two and a half months. I was on my way home from my athletic director job at the Bellevue Club. I get a call from Laura Harvey saying, you've earned your first contract. And I just started bawling. I couldn't speak like snot rockets were coming out, I swear. And I put the phone on mute and I was like, can I just have a second? <laughs> um, and then I gathered myself, got back on the phone and was like, thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> and it was a whopping $5,000 for the year. I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> but I was still so just like proud and 
just all of the stuff that I had been through in the last couple months, it, it made it all worth it. And I knew that I wasn't going to play a lot, but I just knew that that meant that I was that much closer to being where I wanted to be, playing with the best soccer players in the world. Yeah. Crazy. That's crazy. So you go through that experience in Seattle, and then you find out that you're cut, and then you go to play in Australia, and then you played in South Korea. Yeah. <laughs> kind of walk us through that is how you handled that, how you decided to go from which place to which place, how it shaped your life, just all kind of go into that because I don't think many people know that and I think that's something that's so massive about your stories like you found ways to get better and get to the place you wanted to be yeah um I think it's all power and influence um in in connecting with people that's huge Mm -hmm. because there's not many agents that maybe you can trust with women's soccer because we don't get paid enough yeah um, for them to get paid yeah So when I was training with Seattle, I think people picked up that they knew that I wanted to go far. And actually one of the girls on the team got me connected with Cyprus. So first Mm -hmm. I went to Cyprus to play in the champions. Okay. Skip that one. Didn't see that one. My bad. Yeah. Yeah. I played for them. My professional group. I played in uh, a bone. (laughs) That's funny. I played. Yeah. That's where I went after I was in Norway. I played with them in 2017. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, like, a lot of people either, like, know a person, know a friend that had played there, or maybe had an agent and got them, like, a really small contract in some some country you've never heard of, maybe. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it gave me a really good opportunity just to, like, fly and go somewhere and to play. And I found out that I got offered – and then two days later, I got on a flight to go. <laughs> so did you, my bad, I didn't mean to say you got cut. Did you decide to go to Cyprus? Um, it was like, you can say it's like a du- dual thing. It was like, gotcha. Gotcha. Thing. I wasn't going to play. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go. Oh, cool. That's what I did. Yep. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, I wanted to correct myself because there's a difference between deciding to go and it yeah. being like mutual than being like, yeah. Okay, cool. Good. I'm yeah. glad I cleared that up. Either way. I want to put that energy out into the world. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds better if I got cut. And I was like, you know what? I'm going <laughs> to come back and <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And that same girl that got me connected with Cyprus was like, hey, here's a team in Australia. Connect okay. with them. And that was before, like, I got waived or cut from Seattle. Mm-hmm. And they already signed me. So all is good there. So yeah. I went to Cyprus for two months. And then it ended October 15th, right when I had to go to Australia for their preseason. Mm-hmm. So I did that with Cyprus. It was amazing. It was super fun. I was young. I didn't know anything. I connected with some girls there. I learned a little bit of Greek. Mila I agree. I'm Cypriot. Yeah. Hi. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why I like there. <laughs> In Gala, see? I, so I, that's, sorry, not to bring up the story, but that's funny because I forgot about your Cyprus journey. Yeah, I'm a, I play on the national team there. Like, I'm dual no citizen, way. Cypriot, and I played um, – a lot of girls come there for Champions League because we always qualify, yeah. and it's a good competitive thing. But that's so funny that that was how you uh, connected uh, through Australia. That's funny. Do you know Amanda Lena? No. Oh. Well, okay. But, yeah, yeah I, became, I became friends with a lot of the girls there. That's awesome. But. So then you go to Australia – hot it's there for a hot second yeah for for five months it was it was uh-huh. a while a while uh, a while in the soccer world yeah so there is actually when I was like okay I'm important and I'm good mm-hmm. I I played the eight um, okay in the number 10 and I connected really well with Katie Stengel she was on my team mm-hmm. as a forward and I think I played the best soccer I've ever played there. No one w- was watching. I had no expectations. I had a lot of fun going to beaches. Mm-hmm. Um, so fun. Yeah, man. it was just, it was so fun. Yeah. And like Americans were there. So we hung out with them. We we're, I, I was just super young. I wanted to travel and see the world, but I also had the soccer thing and mm-hmm. I didn't, yeah, I didn't think about anything, anything, but just playing. And so that was probably my pivotal 
season as a professional soccer player because I came back um, knowing what I had to do. I came back to Seattle, actually, started training a little bit, Mm -hmm. and I saw some internationals that came in, again, still as a forward, Mm -hmm. and I was like, okay, I, I really don't think I'm done playing overseas, and I don't even know if I'm ready yet, so I reached out to an agent, actually, and I had three opportunities. I had one in Germany, I had one in Sweden, and I had one in South Korea. <laughs> yeah. oh my God. <laughs> and she goes with South Korea. <laughs> South Korea. Well, you okay. might have too if you saw the contract. Yeah, I was gonna say they pay well. We know that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they pay yeah. well. Yeah. Um, no more working three jobs. Uh, yeah, no more working three jobs. I would have paid all of my student debt. And actually, I talked to Anson and Damon from UNC, mm-hmm. and I just kind of got their advice. And they were like, what are your goals for soccer? And I wanted to get better passing technically. And I was like, South Korea is yeah. the perfect way. I mean, Sweden's very similar to the U.S. And Germany, I trained there for a month, and they're very traditional. They don't take care mm-hmm. of people's bodies. We they overtrain them they do a lot of like long distance running and I was like I just want to be super technical quick and smart and South Korea was the way to go and yeah financially it was the better option (laughs) that's crazy Uh, so you just went to South Korea how long were you there for again a year and a half year and a half that's a long time so I thought I was going to sign for six months and then I was going to go to Sweden after but Uh The contract was in Korean, and I signed for that year and the next year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. It's okay. I know Korean. Annyeonghaseyo. Jojinneyo. Pejinida. Were there any English people there? Like, I know that sounds terrible of me to ask, but, like, were you around, or were you just, like, dove deep into South Korea and were, like, dump, jumped in the deep end? It was both. So the person that reached out to me in South Korea – was American, but she was half Korean. Her mom was Korean. She didn't know any Korean, but she was like my American friend. Gotcha. And we joined this international church there. And it was so okay. Seoul in South Korea is an international city. So I got to yeah. I got to hang out with people, but I tried to I tried to be immersed with the culture and learn the language. I I joined a lot of language exchanges and it was really fun and I, I totally immersed myself with the food. The food's amazing in mm-hmm. their culture, which was like a military style camp. Mm-hmm. We had curfew. We had to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. Um, but I got- Is, that, is that only with the team or is that just all civilians in South Korea? Only with teams, yeah. Okay. Was that a dumb question? I feel like that was a really stupid question. <laughs> Don't laugh at me, Tina. You just have to keep your up. I get it. I'm just so confused. I guess it's not North Korea, so I promise I am a smart human being, but that was a dumb question. You wouldn't see the finest up here. <laughs> just kidding. But that's that's actually really, I mean, playing most, I had a similar situation where I was with in with the courage. I was playing, I came in as a center rack, and as you both know, Urseg and Dahlkemper to this day are the starting center back. So I didn't necessarily make a bad decision in terms of being like, I'm not going to play. And even if I get a contract, I, my mindset was like, am I going to, tr- I'm just going to train. Like, am I going to get better? Cause I'm 21 years old. I still have a lot of room. And I know for me, like my Norway experience wasn't great. And I think part of that looking back was on me. Cause I wasn't willing to really dive into the culture. So it's, I appreciate your sentiments. Cause I think, I always tell people when they ask me, should I go play overseas? And my response is always, if you're willing to really go there, because it's hard to go to a country that doesn't speak English and not, you'd isolate yourself. And if isolation is your thing, fine. But I think for most people, you want to feel involved. So it sounds like you, you built relationships there. And I don't know if the girl spoke English, but you were able to kind of (laughs) integrate in a way. Um, I did. However, when I came back, I think I did lose like a part of myself and I became actually kind of depressed. Like I didn't realize that until I came back and I had like no home and I've been out of the country for two years, not seeing family. I traveled all of Southeast Asia by myself and it was like fun and 
it was the easy thing to do to like get away from the world in the U.S. at the time. But when I came back, I was like, oh my gosh, like what am I doing with my life? Because I felt so isolated for so long. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm with you on that girl. I had the same reaction when I came back. Yeah. I came back because I was like so isolated. So you have to be prepared for that. But like, would I take it all back? No, I've learned so much from the experience. That's crazy. Well, I remember when this was when I was deciding on whether I didn't know where I was going yet. I had my season in Chicago and we played a pickup game on the new turf at um, the practice fields. And I don't know how long you've been back, but I'm pretty sure like you were offered by spirit and like you were deciding like to take it. But I remember, cause I hadn't played, hadn't seen you in a couple years. And I remember literally, I remember being like, we were playing and I'm being like, yeah, pages of 30 times better. Like, yeah, it was so sick. And I'm like, yeah, she, she picked up something like, w- did you feel that you were like, at the time when you came back to America, were you like, yeah, I'm ready for this league. Like, I'm not accepting not being in this league. Mm-hmm. Does that question make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't as fit as I, w- I was fit, but in a different way. We run, like, just at a slow pace at all times. So it wasn't, <laughs> like, the sprint U.S. fitness. So yeah. I asked Nick to give me a six-week training program to get more fit. But when I got fit and adding the like technical tactical piece, we played 5v2 every morning before breakfast for an hour. If you think, and they're so good that we get maybe 50 passes before the defenders take it. And yeah, and here it's like trying to get eight passes before. The, no one knows the, the tempo of the pass, the weight of the ball. Like it's incredible there. And um, when I came back, and I started doing that training program and I was studying for the master's program at UNC. I was like, you know what, if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. I read the subtle art of not giving AF and that, <laughs> that, that changed my life because this agent was like, listen, all these teams want you to come to their preseasons. And I go, no, like I'm, I'm over I'm that. Good for that. I'm over that. I'm old. I'm experienced. I've been a professional for three years and yeah. They have to offer me a contract. And at that point, that's when one team offered me a contract and then two other teams offered me a contract. So there's value in not giving an yeah. F all the time. Yeah. <laughs> sure. That's well, remarkable. We now obviously know that you've we well, it seems as though you found a home in Washington. You know, you're you're playing, you're starting. Can you um kind of to round this out, can you kind of talk about your outlook now being in the league? having more of a solidified spot in a team, what are your kind of expectations personally, like goals that you're setting for yourself going into next year? Um, and kind of, frankly, what, you know, I, I mean, you'll probably have a lot of new players, but what are your expectations for the spirit? Um, you guys obviously came in as a fresh new team with a lot of young talent. Um, yeah. What are, what are your thoughts on those two points? Yeah. I mean, personally, my individual goals, um, you never want to stop pursuing something. So it's obviously the U.S. national team outside of the spirit. And I know Black Hill has kept a watch on me, um, which is really exciting to hear. Um, but being with the spirit gives me like passion and excitement because I'm one of the older leadership like roles, helping these young girls, kind of being like the Anton of the team, hopefully. <laughs> Um, it's like really exciting. These all, we have so many young players, and it's not like Seattle was, which isn't a bad thing. But there's no divisions and in, in people, and there's no cliques. It's like everyone is humble and wants to get better, and it's like a really fun squad to be a part of. And we know that we can't be cocky or confident unless we until we earn something, and I think that's what we're all working towards. So. So being a leader next year is really important for me. And um, especially amidst like the pandemic and everything, um, it's been like a really hard year, but I think we've all grown in, yeah, you're right. We had like a fresh new team, but we have a, we have a lot of talent. And I think next year it's about honing into our younger players, making them more experienced to see if we can make it in the top four and hopefully win a national championship. We don't want to always be that young team. We want to be 
we want to be experienced, solid, and mature. Like this year, I saw a lot of immaturities, but the last game we just played against North Carolina Courage, we saw like sparks with a lot of young players, and I'm excited for next year. Yeah, I think just being in the league for the two years that I was, to see the 180 degree that y'all's organization took is remarkable. And where do you, do you think that, that <laughs> my dog is barking because my husband is walking in from golfing. Do you think that, um, where do you see that being, who's the turning point in the organization? Is it the entire team? Is it all the young kids that have been drafted? Because all of a sudden, like, we didn't want to play the spirit anymore. And I feel like that was everyone wanted to play the spirit. And now it's like, the spirit's tough. Like, you, you ain't getting a W without, you know, working for it. Kind of talk about that transition. Um, I always want to say it stems from the top. So we mm -hmm. got a new owner, Steve Baldwin. Mm -hmm. And he, he's like the anthem. He's incredible. He's so passionate. I don't think he realized what kind of work it was. <laughs> it was to own a women's professional soccer team but um yeah the year I came in they switched owners and he's invested a lot in this club and he's a baller he's worked That's with the true. league trying to get sponsorships for the entire league not just our team and I don't think he sleeps um he's been working his tail off he comes and talks to us all the time he hired a great motivating coach like Richie. Um, mm -hmm. He staffed, he like overstaffed the Washington Spirit. We have so many people and now we have four coaches and they had like two back in the day. Um, so he knows what it takes to own a successful business. He owns startups, brings them from the bottom up and he's just a really brilliant, passionate man. And we all, we all see his passion and we don't want to let him down. So it definitely comes from the top and trying to follow a leader that if, if people work super hard for you, you're, you're going to work hard for them and you don't want to disappoint anyone. So, um, yeah, I give most of credit to Steve Baldwin. He's, he's awesome. amazing. Yeah. For him to fill Audi stadium with 20,000 people, that game was insane. insane. Oh, Came down the coolest game I've ever played in. I still like, cry lost. thinking about it. <laughs> I know, granted we lost, but I literally looked yeah. up one time and I was like, you're playing in a pack, like, upper people were in the stands. It was insane. Eight, in, in the 83rd minute, people had their, like, flashlights. Do you remember? Yes. Oh, my God. I got chills. I up and I got distracted. I don't even yeah. know what was happening, but I had a tear in my eye. I was like... Oh if this is where women's soccer is going and how hard our club worked, mm -hmm. I'm just like so excited for the future. And it just makes my purpose all that more important, I guess. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. He's, um, those are the owners we want in the league. Those yeah. are the owners. Totally. Yeah. Okay. Well, we always kind of, um, do a rapid fire at the end, okay. just kind of, kind of you know tie everything together um just six simple questions you can take your time with them um the first one is your favorite coffee drink um black from starbucks of course i honestly that does not surprise me <laughs> in the slightest that it's is so I dry do. and so bold and i love just sipping on hot black coffee i love that mm -hmm. all right describe yourself in three words um Passionate, um, uh, bubbly, is that a good one? Yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and competitive. That's boring, but. Can I add one? Yeah, sure. Resilient. Oh, th sure. that's a good one. For yeah, sure. That's on my jacket. Yeah. Got a 5.0. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, positive. Yeah. I think I'm pretty positive. Yes. I would agree with, yeah. I'd agree with that one too. Um, your favorite NWSL team to play? Did, did you do that look for me to say Orlando or? <laughs> no, you can do whatever one you want. Um, probably, probably North Carolina Courage. 
because they're... We have, to take a tally. we have to take a tally after all we interview everybody. Every it's single different. person said that. North Carolina. So I think they probably have the... It's not even just that they're the top team. They, Abby and... Um, what's her What's her name? Dawkemper? Yeah. Abby Dawkemper and... Why Abby Ersig. Yeah, Ersig. Yeah. Um, they're probably one of the, yeah. one of the top defenders in in the u.s or in the world mm-hmm. whatever and i always like try and compare myself which is like blunt and honest and yeah. i always want to be the de- better defender for the day <laughs> because you drink your coffee black that's why yes <laughs> yes gets me going. i love it i love it okay your current favorite takeout oh yeah that one first. do you guys know kava <laughs> Dude, yes. the OG. We don't have right. it in Chicago, and I every time I'm in North Carolina, I'm like getting kava. Oh yeah, it's amazing, and you and oh. you don't have to get the same thing every time. That's why it's amazing. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Love that. Okay, two more television show you've recently binged. Working Moms. <laughs> oh, amazing! <laughs> I watched the whole thing. It's hilarious. It's- and Netflix only rated it 5.1. I laugh every second of that show. And I kind of get baby fever. And then I'm like, hold up. Let me watch Working Mom. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Okay. And the last one, your favorite teammate. And it can change day to day. It could be your favorite teammate because they bought you coffee today or something. Um, I'd say Bailey Feist because she is my roomie. And she's the best roomie ever. She keeps awesome. things really clean and always does my dishes. Aww. shout out bailey feist shout out yeah. bailey feist shout out awesome well Paige, we cannot thank you enough for taking the time to talk with two wash-ups um <laughs> about your journey and just using this platform to get it out there because i think when it comes from the source and it comes from your mouth i think it's so powerful to you know get it all in one place because it's i think it's a fascinating journey and an inspiring one um tina you got anything yeah no i mean joe's obviously known you for a few years but being an outsider here it's incredible your resiliency is a big reason why i'm always trying to highlight players in the league because i think people need to know about the women that make up what i think is the best league in the world so thank you for coming on and uh good luck with this uh hopefully covid's done soon so you guys can get back into your normal rhythm and enjoy a nice season outside of a a bubble (laughs) outside of a bubble yeah yeah. I'll I'll test the vaccines myself. I just I just you know, I need it. I need it yeah. done. <laughs> Perfect. Well we thank you, Paige. You're the best. Thank you guys so much. That was fun. Awesome.